This is the most effective weapon in martial arts. Kind of. I was about 13 years old when I began to study martial arts. One of the first stories I heard in the dojo goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a young man who was determined to become the greatest swordsman in the land. He practiced long and hard every day and became very skillful. To test himself, he set out on a quest, challenging various swordmasters to fencing contests. If he could beat them, he'd move on. If he couldn't beat them, he'd remain and study their style until he could. Now eventually, he ran out of masters to challenge, except for one the ancient old master of masters. After some difficult persuasion, the old man finally agreed to a contest. At the appointed hour, they met and came on guard. No sooner had they done so than the old man stepped back and said, if you cut to my head, I'll counter with a thrust to your throat. Now, the young man was a little surprised because by coincidence, that was the attack he'd been thinking of. They came on guard again. No sooner had they done so than the old man stepped back and said, you know, if you cut to my knee, I'll counter with a cut to your head. The young man was a little more surprised because, again, that was the attack he'd been considering. For the next quarter of an hour, this happened over and over again. They would come on guard. The old man would step back and say, you know, if you do this, I'll do that. And every time, without fail, the old man named exactly the attack that the young man had been thinking of. Now, the young man was so overwhelmed that he begged the old master to accept him as a student. Well, that's the end of the story. We don't know what happened after that, so go ahead and make up something. Now, when I heard this story, I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Age and experience beats youth and enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not what the story is about. We call this exercise Chevrel's Pendulum. I'll show you how to do it, but it's not something you can actually see. It's, it's like chocolate. Watching me eat it won't teach you anything about it. You have to taste it for yourself. So if you want, pause this video right here, go whip yourself up a pendulum, and then come back and sing along. Hold your pendulum string by the very end and let it hang in neutral. Relax your mind, relax your body. Empty yourself of intentions. Focus your attention on the pendulum weight and then visualize it swinging back and forth. Don't try to make it swing. Don't try to prevent it swinging. Just use your imagination, visualize, see what happens. Maybe visualize it swinging side to side. Maybe visualize it traveling in a clockwise circle. Or visualize it moving in any damn direction you want. Anything interesting to report? If you're like 99.9% .9 of my students, you have telekinetic powers. Just kidding. But the pendulum does seem to obey you. This phenomenon is called idiomotor response. Maxwell Maltz was like um, the godfather of sports psychology. He wrote a book called Psycho-Cybernetics in which he explains this phenomenon in detail. I strongly recommend you read his book twice. But for now, let's just understand that you have a conscious mind and an unconscious or subconscious mind. Your conscious mind is one great big filter. It sorts out what's real from what isn't real. 
Your subconscious mind has no filters at all. It takes everything as equally real. When you put a thought into your conscious mind, your unconscious mind assumes, that's an order, sailor, aye, aye, captain, and starts to carry it out, whether you know it or not, whether you intend it or not. And that includes subtle motor responses of which we're not consciously aware. So I guess the first lesson here is that you better be pretty damn careful about what thoughts you put into your conscious mind. But there is another lesson, too. If it's possible that we're making subtle movements that we're not consciously aware we're making, might it not also be possible that we can perceive such subtle movements without being consciously aware that we're perceiving them? Like you're facing an opponent, and he does something, and you say, man, I knew he was going to do that. And we call it a hunch or a lucky guess. But what if, what if we knew it because he told us he was going to do it and we were in the right state of mind to hear him loud and clear because our mind was otherwise quiet? I think to read your opponent's intentions, you have to have a quiet mind. And if you don't want your opponent to read your intentions, then don't have any. Either way, the most effective martial arts weapon is your mind. And when you fight, maybe the best thing to have in it is nothing. <laughs>